everybody. Welcome to our premiere episode of Let's Talk Dual Universe. Uh, in the green room, we have uh, Nuber and Pantera, Dyfid, Magic, and our special guest, uh, JC, the president and creative director of Nova Quark and Dual Universe. And we have uh, Neris with us as well. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's nice to see everyone. So welcome to Studio G. This is where all the magic happens over here. And uh, we, uh, we got things sorted out. It's, the, uh, it's nice to be back. This is the first time we've done one of our talk shows in, in a while. So uh, we're excited, really excited. We've got uh, a big, uh, big show lined up for you guys and lots of stuff to discuss. Uh, we've got a lot of questions that we've prepared for, uh, for JC. And we'll go through those questions, but you can still send questions, uh, and Magic and Neris will have a look at these. And if we have time, we'll answer some of your questions as well. Anyway, uh, without further ado, and there he is. Good morning, JC. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> All right. Um, so, man, it's been uh, it's been an amazing journey. We, I know Anuber, myself, and our crew here have been involved with you guys since, uh, since just, I think we got involved just after the Kickstarter, uh, but we were here for day one of the uh, pre-alpha, and it's, it's been the most incredible journey that we've ever witnessed in any software development. I've been in this industry for eons, and uh, what you guys have accomplished what you guys have accomplished is is more than noteworthy. It's uh, I think it's it's for the, the record books for sure. And uh, if you and, guys and have, you, and, and, and just a word, I mean, we, we have to congratulate the team. Uh, I have to say, I mean, we have an amazing, incredible, out of this world team. And, you know, they, they're doing a great job. See, and you know, there are no miracles. I mean, lots of things are hard to do, so they take time and so on. But I mean, we have the right guys to solve those problems one after the other and, and get uh, and get the game where it should be going. So that's that's really cool. Congrats to them. The, uh, the yeah, the team is, uh, they, they work so hard and so closely with the with the player community too. The uh, it's unlike anything I've ever witnessed before. Uh, and to have this all happening, you know, while under NDAs, I think, First of all, a really smart step, but it's given, uh, I think it's given the development team uh, the room they need to do the job that they've done. Yeah, and you can see also the, the huge difference uh, in the game uh, performance and, uh, you know, the, the onboarding and everything we've done in the last, uh, let's say, the last three months. Uh, and that, that is the reason why we want to have an NDA, because the, the state of the game before that was not giving a you know, the right image of what we had in mind. And we knew that and it was normal and there was no reason, you know, to, to uh, uh, let people actually talk about that uh, intermediary stage. So that was the reason for the NDA. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy we kept it the, the way we kept it uh, because now you know, we, we, we can show the things that we really wanted to have in the game. There are some issues still, right? But I mean... <laughs> it's... Uh, it's it's okay. <laughs> well, it's, so I mean, right right off the top, before we get into the questions, there's really two for me, uh, and I'll let everybody here uh, talk about the things that have been most notable for them. But in terms of the technology that you guys have created, uh, you had to invent this tech in order to to do what you guys are doing, to, in order to fulfill the vision. But first is uh, your server technology, mm -hmm. to to enable to enable thousands, if not yet millions of people to be able to play in the same realm, in the same universe at the same time. Uh, it has never been done before. And, and I, think, uh, I, I think what you guys have done is just remarkable. And the other thing is the, the mesh server technology. So just real quick, I mean, for anyone who's played voxel games, you, you know the, uh, the issue is everything looks like, uh, like Pantera's, uh, you know, lunch after uh, it sat in the fridge for a while <laughs> but oh, you know, but that lunch is good but you solved you've solved this uh the, you know the melted crayon syndrome that we had in yeah. landmark and every other voxel game that, that we've ever played uh you guys you guys solved that and and if you guys haven't if anyone here watching has not jumped into dual universe yet 
you won't believe it. Look at the uh, look at the live streams, and you're going to see all the player creations are crisp and sharp. And you guys had to invent this technology to make this happen. Yes, indeed. That, that was a absolutely decisive step. And uh, before that, you know, everything was sort of melted, and 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 we knew we had to do something about it. So that that's uh, it's not over, by the way. There are more things coming uh, that you hopefully will not see but are very important for the overall performance which is that when you know when when uh, the meshes are very far we can still reduce the details without you know losing a thing visually but, but you know, lower the load on the on the card which is something we don't do yet we, we know exactly what we want to do we even have a prototype so this is going to come soon but um yeah so th this is decisive because if you look at a lot of fantastic buildings that have been made uh, if you look at them with the previous uh, technology we had, it, it didn't really run very well. It, it was not very exciting. And now it really makes sense to build something gigantic and, and very impressive because everybody will be able to see it as you intended. Some people told us that they discovered their ships for the first time. After that, they actually had a, you know overall view of it without distortion <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that was a big, big step forward. Uh, and so the performance uh, improvements on various levels, um, I'm sure you guys have noticed. And here again, it's not over. I mean, we have more things coming. Uh, but yeah, yeah. It's, um, as you said, it's not on, only the server technology, which is by itself is already a huge uh, part of what we do, but it's that everything is uh, connected to that server technology. The voxel technology, for example, that we're using is not... Uh, particularly new, it's it's well documented. It's called dual contouring, and it's nothing to do with dual universe, but I mean, that's the name it has. And um, that's something that a lot of people are using already, and for many many years, uh, including out of gaming, by the way. It's something that is used a lot in medical applications for rendering 3D, uh, uh, you know, scans and so on. Anyway, the point is. That's not enough because you have to uh, connect that existing technology somehow to the server technology so that when you make a, a modification somewhere in front of you, the guy next to you will see it. How do you do that efficiently? How do you manage that uh, the amount of data you store is not going to go crazy on the server side, etc., etc.? And in general, everything we do gets more complicated because we sort of you know put it inside the context of this. Uh, uh, single shard server technology, and that's that's where, you know, th there's innovation all over the place because uh, nothing sort of works out of the box for us, and that that's uh, yeah, that's a lot of things. <laughs> and Uber, you want to uh, you want to uh, ask the first questions? Yeah, so let's look through the questions here. Um... Should we talk about the wipe first, the upcoming wipe potential, mm -hmm. uh, or let's see. Okay. The wipe, the wipe is on everyone's mind. Top priority. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Understood. And and I think I have some good news here. Um, we have been discussing uh, the okay. So the, the original idea, I will tell you what, what happens. That we wanted to make a much better looking planet, uh, but it was not ready in time. So we actually have kept the planets as they used to be pre-alpha, alpha, and so on. Uh, but it turns out that they are not that bad. And uh, the reasoning we have today is that probably it's better to just keep them like that. I'm, I'm talking about the geometry, you know, the, the, the shape of the mountains and everything, that kind of things, and uh, the different biomes and so on. They're not that bad, and it's probably enough to just do a graphic overhaul on them, you know, trying to improve the texture here and there and, and add maybe more vegetation here and there. Uh, and probably what we're going to do, so. It's kind of confirmed and we discussed it. It's probably what's going to happen unless there is a reason for a wipe that could be something else. You know, it could be uh, something that we need to fix and there's no other way but to wipe to fix it. I don't see anything like that coming, but I mean, it could happen. So just to be sh super clear uh, so that you people are, are understand, it could be that there's a wipe, but it, it is not a planned wipe. It's something that would happen if we really have no choice. Now, the idea is more like... Um, we do this graphic uh, revamp a little bit on the surface, uh, probably relatively quickly. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to give a date, but let, let's say by Christmas would be great. And then we take the time it takes to actually work on completely new planets and put them into a new system. That will be you know, the, the first time we open up for a new system. 
that would make sense to actually uh, get people excited to visit it also because there would be those new planets, uh, those gorgeous graphics and so on. So that, that's more or less where we, we're heading for. So no wipe, that means you know, all the things that you guys have been doing, digging this in, immense uh, volumes inside mountains <laughs> and so on, we, we would actually like to keep that. It would be a bit, little bit sad if we said, okay, uh, wipe, and then it comes a lot of issues. What we would do with territories, because the geography changed completely. So you might, have, you might have a territory right now that is cool and it ends up being underwater. Uh, and for some reason, that's not what you want. Some people like it under water, but I mean, you see the problem. <laughs> it's endless. It's we could do it if that happens. I mean, we give the territory uh, back to everybody, uh, so there's a rush to actually go and claim whatever you can claim in the first hours. And these kind of things. It's not completely undoable. It's not the end of the world. But if we can, we're gonna avoid that and just keep it the way it is. Uh, it means, but it, it's not a new problem in itself, but it means that uh, when you get into the game, you're going to see the sort of the tech that we had in 2016, something like that, right? So 20, something like 2018. And you might think, okay, what happens when we are in 2030? You get the first people getting into the universe. That's what they see. They, they see a technology that is 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see how we can you know, keep improving uh, things why not wiping anything? The only thing that we will not be able to wipe is the geometry. And I don't think this is going to be a problem, even in 2030, because the plan is not that bad. Um, what we could decide at some point is to say, OK, uh, we're going to spawn new players. We're, we're going to spawn a new auction and we'll spawn new players somewhere else. Uh, that's a complicated decision as well. For you know, We could talk for one hour about that. Uh, but you know, there, there are options. But this is interesting, because you know, we're in a single shark. We are the first single shark persistent fully editable world. So we, we get to deal with unheard of problems mm -hmm. that we will have to be able to find solution for. There's no uh, easy way out saying, oh yeah, well, well, let's do like that particular game or something that you know that now everybody agrees on. Uh, most of the time we have to, to come up with the first answer to that problem. <laughs> So that's one example of you know what I was talking about. So hopefully in a wipe, that's the, the big message. Uh, keep doing amazing things, keep investing into your land, into what you do. Uh, we're gonna do everything we can so that uh, we don't have to go through uh, a wipe again. Uh, that's that's the message. Wow, that's uh, that's news. Just a real quick technical thing here, Gio. Can you bump JC's mic up a little bit? I think Code said it was everybody. You can try to get a bit closer also, I guess. Yeah. And then Code said everyone was a little bit quiet. Oh, I get it. We start by volume mixer. <laughs> and then Ilo says, that's a great answer, JC. We, we like that answer. <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, that's question one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, you just answered <laughs> the first five questions. And like... Yep. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so add on question. to that. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. All right. Um... <laughs> So, you know, one of the things to kind of bump off of that is, and this is kind of my question, is we got we got such a rush at the beginning. Without a wipe, uh, some people all get, kind of get concerned that, well, now everybody's just, territories are being used that are just empty and chips everywhere. Um, so is what's the plan on as far as, like, how long can someone stay at a game and and keep their stuff and keep their territory and whatnot. Stay out of game, you said? Out of the game, yeah. Oh, you mean if you don't log in back and, and what happens to your stuff, right? You, you just, yep. let's say you, you, I don't know, you have a health problem, you're, you're out for yeah. several months and it's not your fault and there's nothing you can do, etc. Uh, so this, this is a, a big sort of feature that we are going to have to, uh, to add soon. It's all, uh, there's a lot of uh, work that has been done already, you know, to specify what happens. It's, it's a complicated topic because um, we definitely want to be able to identify players who simply don't play the game anymore. You know, that, that, you know they, their stuff should be recycled because otherwise there will be ultimately, because there's a churn in any game, you know, there will be a lot of things that are meaningless. So I agree, we have to do something about it. So um, 
I don't want to give it in detail because these are thing, things that are still discussed, but the idea is that you will have different periods during which your things will be uh, you know, uh, kept as, as they are, and then another period where you'll be notified that you can actually store them in sort of a virtual place, but they are going to be taken out of the world, but you still keep them. And then when you come back, you can actually go and redeploy them. Uh, and if you don't want that to happen, you can always go back in and reset the counters, etc. But I mean, at some point, if you don't give any sign of yourself for the next six months, uh, your stuff will be sort of stored. You'll be able to get them back if you come back in. But your territory will be uh, recycled and your construct will disappear. We have to do that. There's, there's, you know, there's, there's a, a necessity to actually be able to do that with a long time frame. And we're not talking about weeks, right? We're talking about much more uh, you know, substantial amount of time. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that's, a, that's a very complex problem. Uh, we don't want to, you know, if, if there is anything like uh, someone who, who by mistake gets his construct removed and we can somehow fix it because no one has claimed the territory, I mean, it's, it's really, we can deal on a case-by-case -case basis on these hopefully very rare cases. Uh, but if you leave the game for one year, you don't answer any of the emails where you're asking, oh, are you still there? Uh, your thing's going to be recycled. And when you get back into the game, it's possible your territory has been reclaimed by somebody else. So you're going to have to find another place. You're going to have to be able to redeploy your construct on that place. And that's what we're going to make sure of. Uh, as always, with these kind of things, the tricky part is how do we prevent this to be gained by people who are going to be intentionally using these mechanics to sort of duplicate constructs and things like that. So uh, this is where it gets complicated. I'm not going to go into details, but we're going to work on a specification that, that does that, that, take into account these things. Um, and right now it's not implemented, right? So to be clear at the moment, you can log off the game for as long as you want, come back and everything you had will be there. Unless, of course, it's in the PvP area and you, know, you understand that, of course. <laughs> I'm talking about, uh, yeah. here I'm talking about sanctuary zones, uh, sanctuary moons and safe zones in general. Uh, nothing can happen there uh, unless you, you agree with it. So, uh, yeah, anyway. Not a clear answer, sorry, but uh, the clear thing is that we are working on that and we understand you know, the concern, which is, by the way, another one of those singular problems that occurs only in the universe. So I don't think there's any example of something similar anywhere else. So um, we, we have also in mind, uh, just to, to give you the full picture, uh, sort of a notion of a will where you can sort of uh, explicitly say, well, if I don't go come back for whatever reason, then my stuff go to that person. Uh, that covers the very sad uh, option that, that can happen, you know, that you actually die. You know, that, that's, uh, but, that's a, that just, but it's a reality of life. Happen. Yeah, It's a reality. I mean, it, it will happen, unfortunately. And, and so we, we actually have a way. So especially if you have uh, uh, high responsibilities in the org or something, that you could actually say, if I don't come, I, actually in the org, it could be not at all because uh, you die, but I mean, you have a sort of a contract with your fellow uh, own uh, organization uh, legates, say, guys, I take this responsibility, but don't worry. For whatever reason, I don't show up in the game in one week, it actually falls back automatically to that other person. So to make that kind of things explicit, you can actually state it. And possibly people will require it from you to be able to trust you enough to grant you with certain responsibilities so you don't become a bottleneck for anyone. Uh, so that, that's the kind of things also we, we're thinking about. Uh, but this is more you know, for short-term absence. Um, what we were talking about just before is for long-term uh, you know, single-player type of disappearance. One guy just disappeared didn't have any will whatsoever, but I mean, it's just there and we need to deal with it, right? That's awesome. So another question we have on the list, uh, we've seen the prototype pictures for pets. We've seen a lot of concept art for pets. Um, obviously we know those won't be available for some time, but uh, what are your thoughts on the types of pets that'll be available for the backers? Um, you know, any special uh, abilities like, you know, the light or, you know, a drone that could defend you, that kind of stuff. What's, what's your idea on, on the pets? 
I think the consensus, uh, and I take that from community managers, is that the pets should be cosmetic. But, you know, um, it's not something we really started to work on, to be honest. Uh, okay. Right. So uh, it's going to be there for release because, uh, you know, it's something we promised. So it sort of puts a, a const constraint on what we call the release. Uh, and and so this, this is a lot of work on the art team that right now they don't have time to do. So I don't want to say anything about that because you know we need to uh, kickstart this topic uh, inside the company and 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 come with answers. Um, we we probably could have pets that that would help you, but I mean it would be just uh, not a cosmetic thing. Not something you can just uh, uh, get as a reward. Uh, you would have to craft it or something, I suppose. Uh, it would be like cool. a weapon. So that, that I have personally nothing against that, but um, there will be also cosmetic pets that are just there to be around with you. Um, probably it's going to be robots. Um, I would I would guess you know that we will avoid that, that start to have legs and things that are complicated to animate. Uh, so things that fly around is, is probably going to be the first thing we do. Uh, but maybe I'm, I'm speaking too much here because you know as I said, uh, I have to talk with the, the art mm. team and see what mm -hmm. we can do. Uh, I know it's a very important topic for a lot of people, so um, yep. it's okay. gonna, it's going to come for sure. I mean, uh, it's a uh, it's a necessity in a, in a game like that, like you know, ten or twenty other topics of that kind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we we try to do our best to to cover. And right now, you know, to be clear, the priority and that I think will be an answer to some other questions that that you have. Uh, our priority is to make the game fun, to balance it, to fix the bugs. Um, Maybe to add a few features that we consider uh, fundamental still, you know, that could um, giving the ability, for example, to sell ships is a very important thing. It's still not quite there. I mean, these kind of things are sort of foundational. They, they, they are going to be uh, very impactful for the game. So this gets priority in, in what we develop at the moment. Okay. Uh, Magic, do you want to do a question? Yeah. Um... I got the softer side questions. Um, I was curious about um, <laughs> dogs 42. or cats? Dogs yes, or cats? 42. Dogs or cats? Which do you prefer? <laughs> oh, uh, I think dogs. Okay. Dogs. <laughs> uh, but I don't have a dog. I don't have a cat. But I, I'm considering getting a dog at some point. Um, so that, that's that's my answer. I don't know what that reveals about me. I like cats as well, um, but dogs are so fun and, and you know, they interact with them. Uh, and that's how I see it. <laughs> Again, I never had a dog, so. <laughs> oh, you've never had a dog. Oh, okay. No, it'll be, but, uh, it'll but be fun. <laughs> every time I see a dog, you know, I say, oh, it's so cute. I like to be uh, having that also. But anyway, <laughs> don't have time. So another question that's come up quite a bit is, uh, when do you think we could see uh, more colors of the emissive voxels? Um, I don't know. Uh, not quite soon because we have uh, we have to think about that in a global plan uh, about what we're going to do with uh, cosmetic items that uh, you can buy. Uh, so this is not a surprise. I mean, we have in mind that we sort of monetize this, this kind of thing. So it's possible that these kind of things go into uh, super low cost, but I mean something that we get into the catch up. I want to be transparent on that because, you know, uh, we're running a business. We have put a very low. Uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> doggo! Uh, <laughs> Gio yeah. loves his corgis. <laughs> oh, here's the dog, corgi. So lovely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, corgi. That's awesome. Wow, Great. they got. Oh, they have gotten big. Yeah. Yeah, they have. Okay. <laughs> nice. So, uh, another question. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that, that's about it. I mean, we're gonna see what we put in the cash up and what we don't. Um, but uh, the colored emissives definitely uh, might be one of them. Uh, we'll see. So another question is uh, harvesting things like uh, the soil, the earth, rocks, sand, and trees. What kind of uh, things would those be used for? Like if we have glass voxels at some point, I know there there's some issues around that, but would that be made out of sand? Mm, uh, okay. You know, what, Lots of questions in one one package. Uh, thing. So yeah. uh, I don't know what, what I, well, let's talk about glass voxels. This is uh, very complicated on the technology side, really complicated, more than what we might think about. Uh, so probably not anytime soon. We have a lot of low hanging fruits that, that would be uh, filling that need. 
And uh, so, frankly, don't expect transparent voxels uh, anytime soon. I'm not, I'm not saying no, because there's a lot of cool stuff we could do with that, not only for decorative purposes, but also, you know, to make some kind of water uh, voxel. That, that, I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff, but no, not mm -hmm. much water. Uh, and so about the soil, you can, of course, collect it. As you know, today, the main purpose of it is to use it to, uh, you know, fill the gaps and, and, and sort of terraform around your your uh, outpost or your constructor, your house, this kind of thing. So it doesn't really serve any other purpose so far. Um, but, you know, well, we'll see. Uh, it's supposed to be something that has not a lot of value because you, you dig a lot of it, you know, as you as you do any normal you know, mining operation. So whatever the value of that thing would be, it would be extremely low because the, the supply is gigantic. So it's, uh, we don't have any plan for that. For the trees, it's a different story because um, as you do, you can remove a tree right now, but you don't get anything out of it. If we make it something you can harvest, we are a little bit afraid that people are going to wipe out most of the forest, <laughs> which we like very much. And I'm pretty sure it's going to happen <laughs> sooner or later, right? Because there's a profit in making it. So it's not out of the question, but then we would have to implement something that, that yeah, we'd like to do at some point as well, which is the, the possibility for things to regrow. So you cut a tree, and at some point there's another tree that pops there uh, slowly. And so it's not, I mean, it's something we know how to do, but uh, not a priority again. So... I don't see that coming anytime soon. Uh, so it's better for the moment, you know, that you don't have any particular incentive to wipe out the forest. Uh, <laughs> Chris, that, would be, that would be sad. Because Nuber might do that accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> so, which by, by the way, would be quite an endeavor because uh, there is a lot of forest. If you if you think about it, the time we would take that, we're talking about, I don't remember, uh, several billions of trees just on Iowa. Oh, wow. So, just saying. <laughs> so, but it's nothing that will stop, you know, dedicated player base, I'm sure. So, <laughs> let's be careful. <laughs> yeah. Now, that's one of our other questions here is, so I put down a, a static core and I want to terraform and things of that nature. So, is there any thought about taking things like the trees and the rocks and all, giving them as elements so we can actually make our own little forest? Or it's, you know things of that. It's nature. more or less the same uh, the same kind of uh, technical question about the ability to uh, sort of recreate uh, an asset where they used to be or even where there was not no. Um, it's not a terribly complicated question, but again, I mean, it's not uh, something that we feel is absolutely uh, urgent. Uh, yes, probably you know we we'll, we we'll make something like that uh, along the way. Um, and uh, it, it requires a little bit of development so that we sort of you can develop, you can actually start to put elements also, not only trees. Trees are not elements. Uh, I'm maybe a bit technical here, but I mean, elements are the stuff you have on your constructs, right? In the engines and so on. Trees are what we call uh, deco um, sorry, vegetation, and they are not treated the same way. Uh, we could imagine to have trees as elements. Uh, and that you could actually deploy them on the planets, but then we need to in include the possibility to deploy elements on the planet. Uh, the, the territory units, which are elements on the planets, are currently handled in a very specific way. Uh, so it's hard to generalize. Anyway, lots of tech. Uh, <laughs> uh, nothing we couldn't do in principle. Um, now we have to see, you know, the priority uh, versus other things that are more urgent. So speaking of trees and speaking of me crashing all the time, uh, tree collision. Uh, yeah. Um, I think that's really among the list of the best ideas we have at the last minute uh, <laughs> to say, right, okay, let's get those trees out of the picture because how, what's the fun in this? The, the fun, the reasoning was that it would put a little bit of challenge as you navigate on the surface of the planet so that you avoid forest and then so you plan your trip somehow. So, Well, first of all, it's not clear this is really fun. And second, most people fly anyway, both. So <laughs> it's not like, you know, this, this was in any way really a source of super good, interesting, fun experience in the game. 
better remove the collisions because that was creating a lot of frustrations and it, it started to become a meme. Uh, so that's where, you know, <laughs> we start to know there's something really problematic. Um, I don't think it's going to come back um, for the reasons I just explained. Uh, what, what, does it serve? what purpose does it serve? W why is it cool? Not okay. sure there's a good answer to that. Uh, okay, it breaks immersion a little bit. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but but not that much. I mean, if you go very fast in the forest, I mean, you, you can imagine that you sort of slam between all those trees. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, uh, I, I can whatever. do more than imagine. <laughs> so there's, there's, of course, the, the scene in Star Wars where you, you run with your speeder in the forest. Um, I don't know, maybe we're going to introduce some uh, super large trees to create giant forests where the spacing between trees are, are not so dramatic, uh, I mean, so small as they are in the current, tree, uh, current forest. And then for that particular tree, we might enable collisions so that you get a sort of a game that is about, you know, designing a speeder that is agile enough to be able to fly through this. Not, not clear. It's really fun, but we will see. That would be fun. So let's talk numbers. Uh, looking at the claim territory tiles on the Sanctuary uh, Moon and on Alioth, and then you know your concurrent user account that that uh, has happened since beta. What, what can you tell us about that? Well, it's looking good. Uh, the Sanctuary Moon is, um, if I understand the latest report, is about 18%, uh, so almost 20% uh, taken. Um, since the, in principle, with a few exceptions uh, of people who, who, in principle, were granted uh, two types, in general, it's one type per person, so it gives you an idea of the number of people who are playing the game. Not everybody actually puts the tiles on the moon, so the number is higher. But it gives an order of magnitude, if you want. And uh, it, it means that uh, we should start to, to think about the new moon soon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not. I mean, it's it's completely um, expected. I mean, we, we mm -hmm. the plan was ex explicitly that. Uh, what we didn't know is how fast it would fill up, and uh, that's it. But uh, we're still far, you know, from the. I don't know, you know, at what level we consider that uh, we, we should have another moon because, you know, all tides are fine. I mean, okay, you're not next to a market, but. Um, that's not the only reason why you want to have a, a tile on the moon. Uh, actually, it's supposed to be your, uh, your base where you put your stuff and security. Uh, this is going to be kept way longer uh, if you're not in the, in the game, as we discussed before. So, I mean, this is supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, a, a home place, secure place. But mm -hmm. some people will leave all their time on the moon, and that's perfectly fine. But, you know, if you really don't like the, the, the position of your tile on the moon, the answer is probably to invest into whatever it takes to be able to claim a tile on some other planet and, and build your life somewhere else. And just go back to the moon when you have to store important things. And that's how it becomes, you know, uh, after a long time, after, let's say, several years in the game. Uh, even so, again, it's all fine to decide to spend all your time on your tile in the moon and, and enjoy doing this. It's all right. So, um, yeah, those numbers look good. And um, on Alioth also, I think there's 3%, uh, about 7,000 ties claimed. That's uh, very impressive. Yeah, 7,000 tiles claimed on Alioth? Yes, 7,000. Wow. How much? Wow. Uh, exactly, I don't remember. Close to 8,000. And knowing that it's costly to do that, uh, you know, what we don't know, because we did a look uh, as the time I'm speaking right now, but we, we should look into this, is, you know, what's the average number of tiles per player uh, and organization uh, on IOS on any given planet, uh, taking out the people who don't have any tile at, at all. So we look at the, you know, the tile people uh, and see what, what, what it looks. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. What we hope in the long term, of course, is that you, you start to see some big empires emerging. Mm -hmm. and by the way, there's a, there's a feature we need to work on uh, for the visualization uh, of the tiles that allows to show more clearly uh, you know, who is who. Right now, it's you and the others without an easy way to see where the uh, frontiers are going to be emerging. So this is something we're going to address at some point. 
uh, so you can visually uh, see where that empire, for example, is and, and so on. Uh, but it gets pretty, pretty much, uh, pretty quickly, quite costly to add more tiles. Uh, this is you know, on purpose because we don't want uh, too much proliferation. It has to be meaningful. It has to be investment. Mm -hmm. You really have to want that tile for good reason. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that's that's the the, the underlying logic. Yeah, um, I had a, a question real quick. Uh, when are are, are we going to see animals, fish, something like you know, creatures? Uh, that that's the you know the, the same kind of answer uh, that I give often is that this is really cool. Uh, we can do it, uh, but it's very expensive to do to do it right. You know, there's a lot of work on the, uh, on the art team. On the art team, uh, yeah, for sure. There's probably a lot of work, I suppose. I mean, it depends how much we care about um, those those animals being purely decorative or having an actual existence. That means, you know, if you see some animal, is somebody next to you going to see it as well, or is it more or less, you know, local to your machine? These kind of things, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, so th this this is something we definitely want to do. I mean, it, it would make a lot of sense. It's it's really cool. It's uh, not the easiest, you know, it's not a low hanging fruit for us. Mm. And I would say it would come eventually because, you know, that's that's something you expect. I don't know if you noticed, but we added a little bit of bird thongs when you are inside yeah. the forest. Oh, yeah. So that's oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I had to take my headset off. That's... I was like, is there a bird in my house? Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's the, the cheap first step for us. <laughs> it works. Yeah, you could do I like, like frogs next to water. Yeah. You could do crickets at night. Uh, there's a lot that, of like, immersion yeah. things you could do. That would be awesome. Yeah. So, and uh, that, that, that would be, your, and, and if we want to be uh, pushing this even further, so now we're talking about R&D taking place uh, literally in, in a few years from now, um, you want to have a possibility to you know, make uh, the, those animals very different from one plant to the other, because from an evolutionary point of view, there's absolutely no reason why it's impossible. We have actually the same animals on different plants, unless they've been imported by some spacefaring uh, species like us, uh, all that they're spacefaring themselves. <laughs> Space whales. <laughs> <It's true. Yeah. laughs> uh, but you see what I'm getting. I mean, we, it's also very expensive because we have to develop different animals on different planets. And as the number of planets we increase, that can become a real, real expensive uh, thing that will get us towards procedurally generated animals. Which is a cool thing. I mean, it really thinks about Nomad Sky, for example. They, they did this uh, pretty well. Mm. Uh, so that will be something of that kind. And then, of course, then I'm talking about R and D and things that I don't know when we can do that. For sure, we can. For sure, we would love to work on that. It's exciting, you know, from a, an intellectual perspective. It's interesting uh, problem to solve. But um, again, you know, does it does it make the game really better? It's not going to change fundamentally what the universe is about. So it's um, it's not something that is high on the priority list. Okay. But definitely, yes, we, we would love to. Um, we share the same interest in getting this done. <laughs> I, I can only imagine, yep. Okay, I have a question. Um, what advice would you give to people that want to get into game development as a profession? Oh, uh <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, think you, I think in general, the advice I would give to, to, to people, if they, I would say, if they can afford, uh, they, they should really aim at doing things they really love. And by doing things, you become, you know, what, what you aspire to do. So if you want to, if you love doing games, uh, don't, perhaps, you know, don't, don't spread yourself on other things, do that and, and try to do a game. And, and you know, become good at what you do by, by doing it. Um, and then it will become obvious that uh, you are a competent professional in the gaming uh, uh, field because you've done this game, etc. So that, that sounds, you know, probably, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's not that easy, right? Uh, but, yeah. You just said, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, know, you, you become what you do. Uh, you're not, uh, there's nothing that's going to yeah, grant you the status of a game developer uh, for external reasons if you're not what exactly want. So, I mean, mm -hmm. um, 
And I guess, I mean, it, doesn't, it depends what you want to do in games. Uh, it could be art, it could be programming, it could be game design. I mean, there's a lot of things where um, your passion should be the drive that gets you where you want to go. And your passion will be recognized by uh, people who want to hire you. Uh, when we hire people, we, we, we are more, uh, you know, we, we put a lot of weight in uh, considering whether the person is passionate about what he's doing. Or if it's just a job, which is fine. I mean, we, we need also people who are just doing things because, yeah, well, that's okay. But I mean, um, I think a lot of employers are going to look at uh, you know that, that uh, spark in your eye, and um, if you can back it by actually showing that you have been doing that particular thing that you you want to do uh, on your free time, and that it's a real passion, then you get a higher chance to get into uh, into the industry. So another question, uh, in the game, we can right click elements and there's the UI option for element skin. Can you give us like kind of a brief idea of what you guys have in mind for that? Well, we're going to introduce some ways to uh, you know, change the, the skin of the elements. And that actually might actually be part also of the cash shop things we introduce. Uh, so uh, just to give the element, without changing you know, anything of its uh, features, it's just to give it a different look from the outside. Uh, so that's what it's about. So it's uh, uh, in the making. It's not uh, finished. It's something that sort of works now already. So uh, expect to see things coming that, that way. At some point. And so if I wanted to convert my ship to like an old rust bucket, if you had like a rusty elements thing, that would be... Yeah, possible. that's exactly the idea. Yes, yes. Okay, and more see. generally, we need, we need to improve, you know, the way you can customize the colors of things. And, you mm -hmm. know... Right now, for historical reasons, for example, you have a different material for different colors that, that should not be, or you should have one material and the color as an option. Uh, well, that's historical. Uh, so this, these are all things that uh, are pretty much obvious, right? I mean, something you would expect, and we're going to work on that. So I, I can't I, say I, when, but it's, uh, it's uh, definitely on the roadmap. I have a question that kind of goes along with that. Um, uh, so our avatars, are we going to get more options eventually for changing our avatars' appearance? And with that, are we eventually going to get a third-person view of our avatars? Okay, that, that, that are two different questions. Uh, uh, yes, of course, uh, we, we want to make uh, the options so that it can change the avatar. So the way we think about it right now, it may change, is that you have different, you know, general look for the avatar that is more like a warrior type, more like a diplomat type, more like a trader type, these kind of things. Even so, it's purely visual. I mean, it doesn't actually uh, impact uh, what your talents are, for example. And then on any one of those, let's say, archetypes, you could actually customize certain parts. That's that's the general idea. Uh, so that uh, you, know, you, you have a little bit of evolution possibilities within a certain style that you like. Uh, and so that's that's uh, what we're going to work on. And uh, this work is not really started, uh, so it's something we're going to have to uh, put in motion in the coming month. Uh, but definitely, yes, yes. Um, there's also different outfits that are part of the the things we promised to backers, so we don't forget about that. Don't worry. And that's part <laughs> of this work, you know. <laughs> uh, and and we realized today everybody looks the same, and yeah, it's you don't see the face. Uh, yeah, you have to understand this is this is a cost issue. It's just uh, yeah. sure. it's uh, it's pretty expensive to do this, and we have to make choices. Okay, so one of the biggest questions that came up um, currently we have uh, safe areas within 500 kilometers of most planets. We have safe mm. areas around uh, Alioth, Mattis, and the Sanctuary Moon, and uh, I believe Thades. Um, as the you know the super legate for Infinity Corp, uh, I need to obviously do future planning on when we should be building defenses. When should mm. uh, obviously territory warfare is quite a ways away. We understand that, but as far as the the safe areas, what type of time frame should we start looking at building defenses and things on planets? Uh, it's all tied to uh, territory warfare, indeed. So this, this is when we're going to introduce the final uh, you know, areas for uh, safe zones. Um, by definition, talking about territory warfare means that at least certain planets will not anymore. 
So uh, the only place that we guarantee is going to be safe, if that's what you're after, is the moons, the sanctuary moons. Sorry, not every moon. Uh, and uh, most likely, I mean, all the, the area around the Arc ship will be without uh, PvP. We are not quite, um, you know, sure whether we want to make Alioth entirely uh, safe or some part of Alioth uh, safe, some other parts not safe. Let's say, you know, half of it or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a popular idea. I find idea. it interesting. Yeah, I think it's a good idea because it creates, you know, frontier where interesting things are going to happen. You know, when we cross the frontier, there will be people, you know, uh, basically camping there. And, and um, you know, it makes for a sort of a challenge. Am I going to be able to pass that, that uh, frontier? Well, these kind of things. But there are other issues. So it's not clear this is what we're going to do. Um, uh, right now in the game, you know, the big zone that you see is the safe zone mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that basically gathers a, a bit of space between three planets. Um, I, I'm saying again, you have to be extremely careful when you leave uh, the, the safe zone. If you enter PvP, this is actually serious. You might lose your ship. Consider you're going to lose your ship, right? So, you know, don't don't go there without being uh, sure what you want to do. Uh, maybe watch a, a bunch of uh, videos or streams about what happens during PvP. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also, we lack currently uh, a bunch of features that you would need uh, to be able to defend yourself uh, properly during PvP. You know, there's a lot of things about uh, uh, shields, about uh, counter, uh, electronic countermeasures, but all those things you know, that, that you would need that are not yet in the game. So it's even more dangerous than it's supposed to be uh, to actually just go out into uh, the, the PvP era. I just want to remind that because it's extremely frustrating. You've been <laughs> working for a long time and you know, it could kill you with the pleasure you have to play in the game. So, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So there, there's a there's a report of, a, of, a, of an issue with warp drives where you, you might actually be uh, when you arrive out of warp, you, you could be uh, uh, colliding with something. I've heard about that thing. Mm -hmm. It's very weird because uh, unless there's a bug that arrived, this has been tested. You don't collide during warp. Uh, so there's no way you could, in principle, I mean. I'm not saying it's not happening, but then it's a bug. Uh, you're not supposed to be able to collide with a giant wall uh, at your arrival point. Uh, there is no arrival point, by the way, when you walk on the planet. Uh, so you should, in principle, be able to offset your arrival point by you know, starting from a little bit on the side and get another you know, angle. Uh, I don't know now that I think about it, by the way, if anyone has ever built a warp beacon yet. That would be interesting to look at. But, uh, yeah, I don't, we don't have the mm -hmm. capability yet, but uh, hopefully soon. Okay. <laughs> so if you don't have it, probably nobody has. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, so um, what, what was the other question? Sorry, so to, su to summarize, so the, the last part of it was the, the protective bubbles around all the other planets, uh, mm. the safe zone bubbles. Uh, those will stay in place until territory warfare is added as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because, because there's no uh, there's no way you can actually do a PvP on the planet right now because some of the things are disabled and so yeah. Okay. Do you, do you have <laughs> any kind of estimate on when that will be implemented in the uh, territory warfare? Yeah, and and is do you know about how much notice we'll have before that happens? Okay, we we make you uh, aware of this. This is uh, stalling. Uh, got it. Uh, when. It's, uh, I would have said uh, pretty soon because that was the, supposed to be the first thing we do after beta. The problem is that there's a, a bunch of things that got, you know, in, in so, uh, sort of in between that we know we have to do before that are sort of more important, uh, that are going to fix things uh, and so on. So it might get a little bit shifted from what we hope to do. I'll kind of give you a, a, a time. Uh, okay, let's say within the next six months, something like that. Um, that's that's a large estimate. Hopefully, it's it's gonna be uh, within six months. Um, the interesting thing with territory warfare is that uh, I'm pretty sure this is gonna be you know how it's gonna be implemented. Is that as I said uh, in, in previous uh, you know, talks, when you claim a tile, uh, 
uh, and there are other tiles of yours around, it sort of makes that tile safe. And to unlock it and make it, uh, you know, a tile that you can actually attack, you would have to actually attack first the, the tiles around up to a certain amount, like you know, three tiles or four tiles or something, we don't know yet, but I mean, a certain amount that will uh, sort of unlock the one. Now, that means that if you create a certain, a large enough uh, area of tiles, the one in the center are, you know, de facto sort of uh, semi-safe because before they will be accessible from the outside, you have to basically dig a hole inside the territory, but, you know, claiming some, I mean, reverting the, the, uh, the ownership of several, several tiles on the way. So just saying that the intention is that even though some planets are going to be non uh, are going to be PvP, you might actually witness some large areas within those planets that are de facto safe. I mean, it would require an immense amount of uh, firepower and motivation to uh, get to those tiles, which of course would be possible. And we, some people would try to do it. That would be massive wars and so on. But it's not like, you know, it's going to happen tomorrow. That's more or less, you know, what happens in the real world with a country. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no formal protection <laughs> from <laughs> aggression. It's just that it's very hard. And before you get to the capital of the, of the country, uh, you know, you, you get a bunch of warnings. And, and you know, this is the kind of idea that is uh, behind this. this. Nice. I had a, do we want to yeah I want to get to uh, some of the questions from the community here but I had one more question is uh, is du VR ready uh, or is it planning to be uh, it's not ready uh, we've made experiments uh, many years ago I mean it's uh, um, it's not planned as well okay it would be cool don't get me wrong uh, but you know first of all there's there's a uh, it seems like it's not a big deal, but it is a big deal because you have to double the FPS, basically, because you run mm -hmm, two mm -hmm, images. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, you probably also need to revamp most of the UI and the way you interact. I'm not sure about that, but I mean, it's not of use at all that you could translate the mouse and keyboard experience to a VR without having a lot of development to do. Um, and, you know, the bottom line is that there's not a huge market for VR as I speak. Mm. You know, maybe it's going to change. I hope it's going to change. Mm -hmm. But uh, because of that you know, observation, uh, we, we can't devote to resources. all those. those yeah, I mean, the resources are uh, significant. So I don't see it coming in, a, in, in anytime soon. But let's say that if VR becomes a, a big thing, uh, we certainly are going to jump on that wagon. And at the origin, and that connects, by the way, to another question you had and I didn't answer. At the origin, the choice of making it first person was uh, sort of explicitly because it's meant to be played in VR at some point because this is, you know, the Oasis, the okay. metaverse, whatever. So you're going to be, you know, uh, embodied in inside a virtual reality world, etc. So uh, does it mean we're not going to have a third person view at some point? That was the other question. Here again, I mean, it's... Uh, it seems like a, an easy thing uh, you know, to do, but it requires a lot of work. So that's why we didn't do it yet. Okay. Uh, mostly about collisions with the environment and not having your external camera being able to you know, go inside things that mm -hmm. it's not supposed to. I mean, well, nothing insurmountable, but maybe it's uh, you know in, in big productions, uh, in big you know game companies, this is typically a pretty large team that is in charge of that. It's both the three C, and it's a uh, it's. You know, it's a big topic. <laughs> we don't have a large team to yeah. dedicate to anything like that right now. So, <laughs> which is another reason it's so remarkable what you guys have accomplished. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think the the passion that I mentioned before. I mean, is at the heart of everyone in the team. We yeah. we love what we do, and um, yeah, that's that's how you accomplish the things. You know, it's um, it's a good recipe to try to do things that are outstanding. So, that's great. <laughs> Uh, we got some questions from the audience, from the community here. Uh, Magic, you uh, you want to pick and what you want to field first? Oh my. Um, okay, a big question that's come through from the audience today is about um, Lua and IP. Mm -hmm. um, 
when will Lua Edition have IP protection? It's coming. So uh, the the specification has been done, and it's more part first of the the overall task of making selling constructs a thing. Uh, it's not only that uh, Lua is one part of the problem. The other problem is that you can easily copy paste voxels from uh, a ship you bought uh, and sort of you know make a copy of it mm. without, without having the rights to do so. So that's going to be handled. Uh, there's the practical problem of selling your ship. Uh, you want to put a dispenser with uh, a blueprint, but yeah, you need a blueprint that has a, a one run only, something that doesn't exist yet in the game because mm -hmm. you don't want to give a full blueprint to anyone or it will be super expensive, right? Uh, you need to be able also from the, the client's perspective, you need to be able to, when you, when you buy that, you want to see the batch of what you're going to get because otherwise you have to trust. Right now you see the price. But you don't know exactly what you're going to get, and so obviously this would be abused, and because there is no trust, it will not be used at all. So um, this is part of the you know the global thing, so that uh, we, we transition to a state where basically people can advertise their construct, put a dispenser with a price and a one-time blueprint and all the ingredients to run it, and you can just buy the ship like that. That would be fantastic because suddenly. Uh, you get an industry of, of uh, selling construct that can, that can start. And that includes, in, indeed, uh, making sure Lua is protected. Um, right now, you know, the, the original idea was to obfuscate it, but actually we don't necessarily need that. The only thing we need is that, uh, you know, if, you, if you're not the creator of the construct, you're not allowed to open the Lua uh, editor. That's it. And that's, that's enough. Easy. That's yeah. And, and that's an easy move for us. And um, I like that. We need to think how we can use a little bit of our VMS on that, so that if you know, if you want to have people collaborate, you can actually get that done. So this this is part of the things we're going to solve. Uh, and that's enough. And that's going to be uh, you know uh, enough. You can expose some parameters through the you know UR parameters, and nobody has to actually get inside your code. So. This is coming. It's a very important addition because I believe that the construct uh, trading is going to have a profound impact on the game. Um, the the way I, I've said that many times, mm -hmm. because the, the, you know, the way I see it is that most people will not uh, build their ships. I mean, they, they will build a ship at the beginning to get the hang of it, have a bit of fun with that, but at some point they will just buy a ship that is. You know, probably so good that they don't even know how to do it themselves. And then they will customize it. And that's mm -hmm. the key. You, know, they, mm -hmm. you buy it and you customize. Customizing is easy. You mm -hmm. add things. You, you make it your own somehow. And for that to happen, uh, you, know, you, you need to be able to buy ships. So the, the ship shops that we have put are just a sort of a placeholder uh, just to allow people to get a ship uh, you know, to bypass that if they don't care, if they just want to go in space, they can do that. Uh, but that's that's not supposed to even stay, I would say. Probably at some point we just take them out because there's mm -hmm. you know, shops managed by players uh, selling ships that are way better than what we've put there uh, ourselves. So that's uh, a very important step coming. That's great. <laughs> Magic, there was a question from Metallical that... Uh caught my eye earlier do you have that i don't have them labeled by who asked you okay well, i think i think i know the one he, he's referring to uh, uh it was about uh putting in uh, i guess what you would call pve elements to the game you know mm -hmm. uh, uh like quests or mm. uh things to explore um missions okay. things like that missions yeah Okay, uh, I would say these you know, missions and PvE are sort of different things. Uh, PvE is a form of mission, but missions is more than just PvE. Um, okay, about PvE first, the fact that you can shoot at things, basically, and they are not players. Uh, this is something that will come at least through tutorials, and maybe we'll make those tutorials, you know, you can do them several times uh, with a limit per day or something. Uh, so you can get into a tutorial, it, it creates a sort of a setup for you, and you go and shoot those things that shoot at you, and if you survive that, then you get a reward. That's something for sure we're going to do. I don't think it's super exciting, 
but it's a good way to you know get to know PVP, uh, and that's more tutorial in my view than anything mm -hmm. that would be you know cool that you enjoy doing regularly. Still, it would be a way to make a bit of money that is not about mining. So that's that's going in the right direction. That's good. Now the big thing, uh, and this is also something very important that that is uh, pretty high on the priority is uh, the player-driven mission system. Uh, so the idea is that any player or organization can actually create a sort of a mission, think of it as a quest, that states something that it needs to be done and publish that uh, publicly or within the org if they want to make it uh, you know, an org only thing. And, and if they publish it, that, that means that on the other side, any player can actually look at what is available in terms of mission and pick what, what he wants. Uh, the key thing is here, you need to be able to sort those missions based on how far they are, maybe how difficult they are, based on some criteria to evaluate that. Um, there is some way, we, we need to have a way uh, you know, to be able to uh, sort of give a, give a feedback about past missions so that you have a sense of, is this mission issuer uh, trustable or not? Uh, because the first iteration of that mission system will be purely the card. If you say what you need, I need that, I need, uh, I, I'm, I'm out of fuel, I need help, I need some, uh, some, something to be transported, I need some particular uh, rare thing that I don't find on the market, these kind of things. Uh, but it would be purely declarative. So it's, it's a, a declaration of a need, and then players will have to interact and to build trust so that they can actually do this. The next step, which is going to take a way more time to develop, is to make this at least part of those missions uh, formally enforced by the game. So if I want something to be delivered, I will you know, designate a particular container, and whenever somebody is going to put this thing inside the container, the games you know, detects that and say the mission is completed, you get the reward that was sort of uh, uh, East Code somehow before, so you're sure you're going to get your money. Uh, these kind of things it takes more time to develop, mm -hmm. uh, but that's the direction we want to go. Um, that's that's right, going to be exciting. Right now, yeah, right now we're going to make it completely open. It's like you know you can already do that today. I mean, you go on a forum and you just write, "I need some some help with see yeah. what happens," and chat with people. We just make it more integrated in the game. Uh, we make sure so that some missions sort of pop for you, uh, so that you know, somebody who's in the game doesn't know what to do uh, at I some just, point. Oh. Suggestion and yep. things like that. So this this is going to happen within the game, but uh, the game is not going to support any uh, uh, formal enforcement of that. That's mm -hmm. at the same time is a bit something we we're worried about because um, uh, it's obvious how we can abuse that. So it's a form of PvP at some point. I mean, you have to be careful who is calling for help, and if it's calling for SOS with a huge reward announced. Uh, within uh, <laughs> a PvP area, you know, use your judgment uh, about <laughs> that kind of offer. That 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 would be. I mean, that's the spirit uh, in which we want to do things. Uh, we don't we don't necessarily want to babysit every player uh, in the sense that you are. It's part of the game, you know, to be careful and to be uh, thoughtful it's about what you do. Dangerous but, activities uh, like bounty hunting, you know. <laughs> sure, sure. I've seen that. Yeah. So this could be that would be expressible in that system. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to put a bounty on that guy. <laughs> that, that would yeah, that would be neat. Uh, I, and I see it integrating into the design of the game at some point. I really do. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so it's a bit long, but there's another part to uh, to the, another kind of answer to that. We're going to continue to do events in game and mm -hmm. to organize interesting things to to find within the game puzzles. Uh, big enigmas where you have to you know, think about uh, what does it mean and, and you know, there's this some big you know race going on at the moment in the game to understand something. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to generalize that, make more of those, and and more work more on the lore, generally mm -hmm. speaking, mm -hmm. uh, so that for, for someone who just want to go around in the world and try to figure out what's going on, you know, learn more about uh, you know what what's the story basically. Uh, that would be possible. So um, that adds up, you know, to the missions, uh, to the the tutorials where you can learn to to do PvP. That will actually add more of a flavor of mm. I would say the traditional uh, quest-driven uh, MMO. But it will never be like those quest-driven MMOs because we are in a single shard. 
things are real. You cannot just have, uh, you know, uh, magicians that tell you to go get some mushrooms in the forest. And we cannot actually also do the kind of uh, high quality uh, quest that you find in, I don't know, The Witcher or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well, for, like, because that's extremely costly to do <laughs> uh, and, and it's very hard to do well. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that's a challenge in itself. And also you are part of a world where everything you do is available to everyone. So it's, it's just impossible to do it in a traditional way. You're not in an instance. Right? So we have to reinvent that. And as often it goes through the players by a system that allows them to emerge you know, something that would otherwise that you would find in a, I would say, a traditional game, that we would find otherwise uh, made by the game designers themselves. So here we are about giving the tools so that this can emerge uh, without, within the game directly by the players. Mm -hmm. We so we're we're running low on time. I know JC's got to get back to work. Uh, I magic was there a burning question that needed to be asked? Um, because I have one. I okay, go ahead. Too, but go for it, Gio. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I, I just wanted to say, JC, you know, Nuber and I have been uh, in the business world for a very long time as, as uh, entrepreneurs. And you are unique among presidents, CEOs. Uh, you, you seem to have a, a passion. A, a, you get inspiration from, from someplace that uh, most, <laughs> most people we see in, in business and game development and, and other industries just don't have. And where do you draw your inspirations? What, what motive, well, what drives you? You know, I'm, I'm a gamer myself, so I, I like to play games. I've played a lot of games and, you know, I, I, I immediately start to think, you know, how I would like them to be. And so at some point, um, because I'm also uh, uh, someone who knows about technologies and things, I mean, I, I thought about actually trying to do it. And that's, that's the, the, the origin. Otherwise, you know, I'm a fan of science fiction, I'm a bit of a nerd. Um, you know, my, my past time is reading about uh, quantum field theory and, and those kind of nerdy stuff. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not very uh, different, I think, from the, the players themselves. And so that's perhaps a difference with uh, uh, maybe more, you know, business oriented executives that are, you know, uh, looking at big numbers and things. I do that also, of course, I'm running mm -hmm. a business and I'm perfectly aware of all the constraints that will actually make it uh, survive in the long term, mm -hmm. which is a condition for everything else to happen. So I, I, I have this awareness and, um, you know, I care a lot about that. But the origin, the, the impulse comes from something that is very close to the players, I think. Because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm one of you guys. I want to play that game as well. <laughs> That's very simple, in fact. That's great. <laughs> That's actually a great segue into my question. Last question. Uh, besides DU, what's your favorite game right now? Oh, that's that's uh, that's dangerous to answer, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> uh, you know there's this. Well, um, or I guess what are you playing right now? The, right now, I'm going to be honest with you. I play Doom Eternal, and I'm a big fan of Doom because <laughs> I don't know, I love this game. Yeah, it has sure, nothing uh, to do with Dual Universe, so <laughs> uh, it's just it's just uh, I like the pace of it. I like uh, how incredibly well you know the game design has been done so balanced and so on uh, anyway uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I play a lot of games that are in general you know i'm interested in games that are going to immerse you into an experience where you can forget that it's not real and that you can actually uh you know uh, uh leave a character role play some somehow and and you know, explore things um uh, i like uh, smart puzzle games that you know Talos principle i really liked uh these kind of things um, I like RPGs. I like a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I should say what, what kind of games I don't necessarily like. Um, I'm not a big platformer. I don't, you know. Mm -hmm. I think I'm not in general very much interested in games that are not in three dimensions, emerging inside a sort of virtual reality. And that's where you know you connect, obviously, mm -hmm. with the universe, is to try to create the ultimate virtual experience where actually nothing is fake because you always have that moment where in a game you get to that door, try to open it and, ah, sorry, it's fake. There's nothing behind the door at all. You know that, it's okay. You can, you can continue playing and you know how to you know, forget about that detail. But the point is, 
uh, I think it's time that, that we have a world that is not fake. Right? Everything is sort of real. What does it mean to be real? It's an interesting philosophical question. Uh, but at some point, you know, when you care about things, where the universe has a sort of a persistence, that things follow some rules that are not random, that really smells like reality in a sense that you can start to make plans and you can you know, project yourself about you know, things that are going to happen. And the thing runs whether you're there or not. This resembles a lot, uh, you know, sort of a definition of reality. Reality is uh, what, what is still there when you stop believing in uh, it. I think it was from uh, Philip K. Dick, uh, if I remember well, or uh, if I get that quote correct. But it's very true. I mean, and so that's, that's uh, 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 you know, how I got interested in gaming. I started uh, playing games as a child, like everybody with all sorts of um, Tetris games and so on, and mm -hmm. I lost interest. And I came back uh, and I got interested again in gaming when the 3D immersion arrived. So at the time of Quake and Doom and things like that. So you get, awesome. you get the story here. Doom, <laughs> Doom Eternal, that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, well, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. really cool. I like it. Yeah, it's a good game. I'm playing it now, too. It's nice. In Nightmare, please. In Nightmare. I'm Nightmare. not ready for that yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Well, everybody. I can't, I can't imagine. Thank you so much for tuning in. JC, thank you for your time. And uh, this, yes, will be, you. this will be a continuing series. And we hope to have more guests from NovaCork on. And as we'll also be having uh, guests from the community as well, uh, other, other streamers and people that have really done some, some big things in the game. And there are quite a few. So uh, we're, we're honored to have you as our very first guest, JC. Yes, thank, thank you for you. having me. Thank you. And, uh, you know, see you soon in your universe, as I say. And I hope you keep, you know, having fun. And we're going to be able to, you know, solve all the things that are missing and you know, stay close to the community, uh, which is so important for us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And everybody, we're going to roll the, uh, the trailer for the beta. And, uh, and with that, we'll see you in game. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.